So when this podcast comes out, the Husum, and I know I'm mispronouncing that. I cannot pronounce that word. It's the German word. But the Husum Win Conference will be going on in Husum, uh, Germany, which it sounds like most of the wind industry is going to be over there. We're not going to be there. Uh, but one of the things that comes out during these big conferences is PES Wind. And I got my latest copy of PES Wind in the mail the other day and was thumbing through it. And there's a really interesting article by the people at 11i. And 11i does CMS measurements of blades by putting accelerometers in the blades and then using, from what I can read, uh, some really powerful software to look at the vibration modes and the flexibility of the blades and then in, give us a sense of how well the blades are doing health-wise. Um, and th I haven't seen a lot of that being used in the field, particularly here in the States. I have seen it used if they have blades that have known issues where they're trying to detect it quite early. So it's sort of interesting to, 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 to hear some of the details behind the scenes. Uh, so, Rosemary, how do these accelerometer CMS blade monitoring systems work? And why, are, from what I can tell, they're not heavily deployed. Why are they not deployed in a lot more places? Oh, are they not heavily deployed? I mean, they're not in every, every blade. I've used them a lot in, uh, you know, prototype systems and people are using them a lot where they've got icing systems because you can use it to, you know, detect some stuff to do with blade icing. But yeah, to explain how they work, it's an, an accelerometer. And I, I guess it's similar to the kind of accelerometer that you've got in your, your phone. You know, it can measure uh, movements, I guess, basically, not accelerations, literally. Um, and what they can do from that is they can tell the, the frequency, you know, so um, the, the blade is bending backwards and, and forth from different loads and you know, every every structural component has a, a natural frequency that it, it resonates at. And that depends on a lot of things, including, you know, the length, the mass, the stiffness. Um, so if any of those properties change, then the frequency is going to change. And so that's basically how they, you know, they, they figure out that something's wrong. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, how they actually go from a change in frequency to saying, okay, you've got a structural defect or you've got extra mass on your blade. Um, that is, I guess, in the, <laughs> the, you know, special IP of, of each accelerometer, um, company. It sounds like there's a lot of software behind the scenes to analyze all that because you're, you're getting a bunch of frequency data back essentially, right? Well, I mean, you, as a wind turbine operator, you don't see frequency data, you know, all that. It's like kind of like a black box and it out, out pops some information that, you know, <laughs> tells you, oh uh, yeah, you've got a, a so something's changed and you know this is what this is what we think it is so when i was um using it on um you know de in de-icing systems then it's basically looking at uh is it possible that there is an icing situation going on we have detected that it seems like your blade weighs a bit more than it did you know a few <laughs> a few minutes ago and so you can kind of deduce that okay if it you know all of a sudden a blade weighs more than it used to then that is probably from icing if you know if it's around zero degrees and um, yeah, and, and you would otherwise expect icing. So uh, 11, I was saying they only need about three accelerometers in each blade. That doesn't seem like quite enough somehow, but maybe they're, uh, if the software is right, you probably can learn a lot in, in giving the amount of times that it's rotating around doing the same thing. It must be, uh, must be accumulating enough data to do something with it, obviously. Yeah, well, even with a single, when I was using it, it was just a single location. You put a, a sensor on the, the blade web usually um, you know, somewhere where you can like f um, close enough to the root of the blade that you're still able to, you know, have a human go in and, and access it. Um, and then it's, you know, there's a wire that goes down to through the, the blade root and um, eventually talks to the turbine controller in, in most cases, or it can be a standalone system if you don't need to use it for controls purposes. Um, and, you know, just from one, one sensor, you can tell, uh, a lot, the natural frequency of the blade. But I guess if you're looking for um, structural damage, which you would if you're, you know, you're trying to monitor an individual blade over time and see um, changes that might be about to lead to some sort of failure, then you're going to be relying on the fact that if you've got like a small fracture or something, then it's going to slightly change the stiffness, the flexibility of the blade. And I'm uh, I'm just speculating here because I've never worked on a system that had multiple sensors in it, but I'm assuming that if you have more than one sensor, 
you're probably going to be better able to tell where where that fault might be located because it's probably not that useful to say somewhere on the blade something has happened, you know, go and just go over the entire blade with a fine tooth comb from the inside and out um, over the whole length. You know, that's a bit of a needle in a haystack sort of situation. So, yeah, like I said, that's that's me speculating, but I'm assuming that that's what the multiple sensors is about. I'm wondering on offshore turbines, because the blades, all the blades there in the United States are going to be new to the U.S., and we don't have anything that big. Do is it make sense to put this kind of CMS system in, you know, the eleven I system to monitor blades? Because what do you know? And the turbines are pretty far away from shore. It's not easy to get to. It seems like you gotta have some sort of monitoring system on the blades. We are starting to see more and more um your preventative maintenance type stuff. So I mean, aside from um monitoring blades themselves, there's a lot a whole lot of companies that are looking at any kind of rotating component and checking for, you know, changes in in vibrations associated with that. Because, you know, if you've got one bearing that's got a flat spot on it, then it's going to, um, you know, it's going to vibrate differently than it used to. And so there's a ton of different companies working on that. And also because it's not just the wind industry that, um, you know, needs that kind of uh, monitoring and preventative maintenance. And, you know, like obviously you can – save a lot by maintaining a dodgy bearing or maybe it's even just you know like you got a, a leak and there's no grease in there anymore or you know um a bit of gravel got in there or you know something like that you, you can imagine like we were talking before about those um nordex turbines that have problems in the main bearing and you've got to remove the whole rotor to replace that so if you can get in early and prevent that from happening you can just imagine the um immense cost that can be saved so that's a, a really standard um standard kind of thing and then with the blade condition monitoring i mean that's another thing we've been talking about a lot on the channel um, on the podcast is uh about manufacturers that are having these serial defects with with blade failures um and in some cases we're seeing you know like catastrophic failures where a blade snaps in half um and you know a whole turbine collapses like rare but um, if you know that this has happened on occasion with the type of failure that you are expecting in a, a, you know, a fleet of blades, then you can imagine that it's really nice to be sure that a blade is not going to fling itself onto, you know, some service personnel or bystander. By the way, uh, to, to address one of your other questions, Alan, this, the reason that you're not seeing as much of this technology deployed onshore has been largely because of cost. And you will see more CMS used in offshore, not just because, as you mentioned, they're so far away from shore and, and less accessible to service techs um, to be able to detect issues and, and you know, conduct periodic inspections. Um, but offshore turbines are just more highly sensorized because they can afford to be um, you know, you, you're paying, you know, 1.6, 1.7 million a megawatt for an offshore turbine, although not in China, but, um, most of the rest of the world, you're paying that, um, back in the days of, you know, uh, $700,000 a megawatt for onshore turbines, you weren't really able to afford, uh, a CMS if you're an asset owner, because it was going to eat into your, your asset profitability. Phil, I wonder if there's two Good examples here, more recent examples that would make sense to put an, an 11i type system in. One is the Siemens Gamesa with the 5X blades where they have a lot of blades out in service and you know there's going to be an issue. So just insurance wise, why would you not do something like this just to make sure you, you don't have a, a failure? Because detecting composite issues is really difficult, right? You, you, you may know the BA. I think, what do they say, 30% of the blades have some issues. So you may be part of the 30%, you may be part of the 70% that doesn't have an issue, but the only way to know is to instrument it. And I think the, the second one is, as these turbines get bigger, like you were saying, even onshore, like there's got to be a threshold, like in the three, four, five megawatts, where it does make sense to put a, a 11 ICMS system in. Yes, uh, certainly onshore, once you once you get like beyond five megawatt, yeah. I, I think the there's kind of two two strategies for offshore things are you know, turbine is expensive to start with so it's a you know a smaller incremental cost addition to add these you know straight out of the factory and secondly a maintenance costs are a lot a lot higher you know it takes a lot 
um, more of an effort to get, get a maintenance team out to an offshore turbine. So you're going to be much more likely to see these, you know, straight out of the factory systems installed in offshore turbines. For onshore, I definitely don't think that you're going to uh, going to be paying for, you know, the state of the art system to be installed on every um, turbine yeah. unless you've got a specific reason. So, you know, like I mentioned earlier in the case of where you're expecting icing, then that might be one reason why you would have um, you know, accelerometers in there as an additional ice detection sensor because um, none of the none of the ice detection uh, sensors are, are very, you know, are, are perfect. So you usually combine multiple systems. And then the other thing would be where you know that you have potentially got a problem and, you know, like in the case that we've talked about on this um, podcast before where, uh, you know, Siemens Gamesa has this blade wrinkle problem and you know the affected fleet. So, you know, okay, my wind farm has this problem, it, you know, it's got affected blades and you know that in the very worst case, this results in catastrophic blade failure, a blade folds in half and a turbine um, collapses. Um, so you really want to be sure for a safety point of view and also, you know, just, um, for public relations as well. It's really, it's a really bad look. Right. Um, and so you want to be really sure that something like that's not going to happen. Um, and this is the sort of issue that I work on a lot with the, the work that I do at Pilot Consulting when I go and help, um, wind farm owners that have defects in their, their blades on their wind farms. In most cases, you're trying to keep the turbines operating, right? You don't want to just shut down your turbine for what could be. It, it, I mean, it can be a, a year, right? If you need new blades um, and you don't have a crane on site and they're not making your blade anymore or, you know, they're going flat out making blades for other customers, you know, it's not always easy to get these problems fixed quickly, especially if it's a, a whole um, fleet-wide problem. So you're trying to leave the turbines operating, but the customer always wants to know, is it safe to do so? And uh, the manufacturer can never really say for sure. You can only say statistically, you know, we've got 10,000 affected blades and we've had two yeah, catastrophic yeah. failures, you know, like the odds aren't high, but it's not, it's a non-zero risk. And then that's when you're looking for sensors that you can um, have to give you an early warning because, you know, it's like the main, <laughs> the main um, struggle that I have with the work that I do. Okay. We recommend more frequent monitoring. How frequently? Well, there's like actually no interval where you can say definitely this is safe and you're not going to have a catastro catastrophic failure in between inspection intervals because composite materials by their nature, they, they fail in unpredictable ways. And so you do have to look statistically and you can, you know, say, okay, this is growing at, you know, one millimeter per day or whatever, but that's, that's an average. It's not going to, it's not growing. A, a defect is not growing one millimeter per day. It'll be zero, zero, zero. 10, <laughs> zero, 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 50 broken, you know, that's, that's how it works. So I, I doubt that these systems are very easy to install um, as a retrofit. Like you could put one accelerometer in pretty easy because you just, you know, go into the blade and, and walk in and glue it onto the web and, um, you know, connect up a cable. Yeah. That's not such a huge deal. But if you've got multiple sensors, then you're probably going to need to have a, a rope access team cut into the blade and um, stick them on and have wireless um, communication. So robots, you still I mean, there's a lot of stuff inside a blade. And when you get down to the, the tip part of the blade, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of space even for a robot. Um, yeah. So I, I think y you do usually end up cutting in when you want to put stuff in the blade um, that's, you know, towards the, the tip. And in that case, yeah, it's not not probably going to be the the easiest, most cost effective thing, but it might be cheaper than keeping a turbine shut for a year. You know, Rosemary, I, I get the PES wind in the mail, and there's a ton of information in, in this issue, uh, and, and everybody is over in Germany ought to pick up a copy because I've only read through about a quarter of it, and it's there's a lot of good articles. <laughs> In this magazine, I, I think if you're in the industry and you want to know what's happening around the world in terms of wind energy, you got to get a free PES Wind magazine. Just go online. It's PESWind.com. It's free. <laughs> 